What's up, everyone? I hope you all had a great weekend and you're ready to kick this week off. I get a lot of questions on Instagram and via email. And the number one question I always get is, how do I prepare for a CWI exam, as I mentioned before? And I went ahead and I answered that question back in episode 307. But the next most popular question that I get is how to bid a job. And I think it's a question that pertains to a lot of folks that listen to this show. As welders, we often do a lot of side work or, you know, we're planning to go off on our own to perform fabrication services, repairs, or installs. So in this episode, I'm going to go ahead and break down how to bid your next job. We'll get right into the episode after a quick word from our supporters. Today's episode of the Arc Junkies podcast is brought to you by CK Worldwide. Let's take a moment and talk about power and precision with CK Worldwide's MT375 ACDC. This machine is a welder's dream. With a crisp arc start at just 5 amps, it handles delicate thin metals and goes all the way up to half inch thick material. But the MT375 is more than just power, it's the complete package. Featuring their new dual pump water cooler, keeping your torch cooler for longer, the steady grip foot pedal, which is a total game changer, allowing you to flip between foot pedal and fingertip control for those out of position welds. And it comes loaded with a 350 amp flex neck torch, a gas saver kit, and all the accessories you need. Just add coolant and gas. The MT375 is backed by CK Worldwide's three-year warranty. For more information, visit ckworldwide.com or contact their wonderful customer service team to set up a demo. CK Worldwide, the standard in TIG welding. We're also brought to you by Rock Mount Research and Alloys. Do you make repairs on a daily basis? Are you a maintenance welder, a shop welder, a mobile welder, a heavy equipment technician, or the company's go-to welder for everything that breaks? then you need to check out Rock Mount Research and Alloys. They have a solution for every repair when it comes to welding. Most of us rely on 70S6, 7018, or 6013 to fix the majority of broken equipment we run into. But there's a better option out there, and that option is Rock Mount. With over 50 years developing tried and true electrodes for the maintenance welding industry and heavy equipment industry, there's not much out there that Rock Mount can't help you fix. Give my friends at Rock Mount a call at one 800 272 7637 and talk to one of their specialists and tell them the arc junkie sent you already know which electrodes or wire you need head on over to rockmountwelding.com and place your order directly and if you spend over 250 dollars you can get a free one pound tube of tartan triple a when you use code word ajp in the discount box at checkout weld stronger so your repairs can last longer with rock mount we're also brought to you by fronius usa they recently released two new welding products to unleash your full welding potential first up is the fronius dual wire feed the new WF25i gives welders the freedom to have two torches ready to go, each for different wire types or sizes, different welding parameters, and easily switchable at the touch of a button. No need to change wire spools or consumables between applications. Get precision wire feeding and save time without adding complexity to your day. Next is the mobile fume extraction system, the Exento. The Exento comes in both a high vac and a low vac version to fit your specific welding needs. The LOVAC system includes a flexible extraction arm with 360 degrees of rotation and a flow optimized hood for exceptional fume capture rate. The HIVAC system combines perfectly with the Exento torch kits to remove more than 99.9% of captured fume particulates at the arc to provide excellent extraction in a compact unit. For more information on these products, head on over to FroniusUSA.com. We're also brought to you by Outlaw Leather. Outlaw handcrafts custom leather hoods, arm pads, tool belts, bolt bags, pig ears, and more. Each piece they produce is made by hand using the highest quality of leather available. They even carry exotic leathers like Cayman, Stingray, Elephant, and Ostrich. For all your custom orders, just send an email to info at outlawleatherllc.com and the team out there will get you taken care of with their first class customer service. Or maybe you need something a bit faster. You can shop outlawleather.com and get fast, easy shipping right to your home or job site. And as a listener to the Arc Junkies podcast, you can save 15% off on all their in-stock handmade leather goods when you use Arc Junkies in the discount box at checkout. Don't be fooled by copycats out there. Shop Outlaw Leather and get a quality piece from the originators. All right, you know what time it is. Fire up your machine, drop your hood, and turn me up five. Thank you for downloading show number 313 of the Arc Junkies podcast. You're listening to the Arc Junkies Podcast. Helping you make every weld better than your last with each episode. And now your host, 
Jason Becker. So many of us already know how to do the work. We know how to read the blueprints. We know how to cut. We know how to fit. We know how to fabricate. We know how to finish. We know how to detail parts out. We know how to do the installs. But many of us just don't know how to bid the incoming jobs. Or maybe you've got a pretty good idea on how to bid, but you're not making enough off of what you're doing to justify staying in business or taking that leap of faith into full-time business on your own. Well, in this episode, I want to help you all by breaking things down line by line so that you can win that next bid, become more competitive on your rates, and keep work rolling through the doors and not lose your ass in the process. With the cost of materials going up, along with the price of everything else, it's getting even harder and harder to price your bids. So the first thing you really need to know is what does it cost you to do business? Most people nowadays, they really, you know, they they want the work done, but they don't even want to cover the cost of materials let alone the associated cost of labor and other expenses that accompany getting the job done. I just had a lady that reached out to me. She was kind of on a short time crunch and she needed this piece built for, you know, her, her wedding. She was having this uh, big extravagant wedding and this was kind of one of the last things she needed to do. And she was on a limited budget and she wanted this like beautiful, like uh, it kind of looked like a panel, like a fence panel, but it was very like ornate uh, architectural ornamental type deal. And she asked me if I could submit a bid and I was like, yeah, sure thing. No problem. So I figured out, you know, she sent me the, 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 uh, the photo, what she wanted, the sizes and everything. She's like, Hey, I want it, you know, to look like this. I need it powder coated. I was like, okay, cool. No problem. So I go through, I work it all out. The price of material was like ridiculous, but you know, I went ahead and set her the bid and she's like, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just not gonna be able to swing that. And that's going to happen. I mean, you're going to bid on work and people aren't going to accept your bid because A lot of times they're like, yeah, no, you're too expensive. And that's just the customer's way of saying that they're either too cheap or you're outside of their budget. So don't sell yourself short. I mean, like I said, cost of materials, everything's going up. You can't start pricing yourself lower in order to remain competitive. You got to know what you're worth. And one of the ways you have to figure this stuff out, like how do, like, what's the first step in figuring out what I need to charge a customer to build something? All right you need to figure out what the cost of doing business is. Once you know your cost of doing business, everything else is going to fall into place. This is one area that you have the most control over. You can't control the cost of materials. You can't control the cost of fuel. You can't control the cost of consumables. You can't control the cost of outsourcing certain things that need to be done, but you can somewhat control the cost of doing business. Once you know your associated costs, you can become more competitive in your line of work. I like to look at my annual costs first and then divide everything up into 12 equal months. Now, there's some costs that just, you know, you're not going to incur these on a monthly basis, but you need to account for them on as a line item in your monthly expenses. Now, how do you figure out the cost of doing business? It's actually a lot more easier than you think. What do you need to break even at the end of every month? What is the bare minimum? Now, everybody's monthly expenses, it's going to differ depending on several factors. So I can't list everything out and, you know, 100%. But I want to give you all some common examples that most people that are into fabrication, most people that are running their own business, you're all going to have these same type of expenses. But like I said, you need to kind of add in anything that I don't cover here. But, I'm, you know, I'm going to go ahead and hit you with a couple examples. The first and most important line item that you have is your space. Are you working in a shop that has a lease? Um, Are you paying on a loan for your shop? Or are you working at your garage? If you're working in a shop or a lease, you know, or paying on a bank note or and financing a spot, you should already know exactly what that number is. But let's say you're working out of your garage, right? You're a small operation right up front, a little one man band. And you might think that it doesn't cost me anything to to utilize my garage because I'm already paying that with my either my mortgage or the rent that I'm paying the landlord, but you actually, you, that's not hundred percent correct. you you still need to compensate or you need to, you need to figure out what it costs to use that space. So for this example, I'm just going to throw out some very simple numbers here because I know a lot of y'all are driving or you're under the hood right now and you're listening to this episode. So let's say you got a 2000 square foot home and your mortgage or your lease or whatever the case 
it's $2,000 a month. Like I said, we're going to use pretty simple numbers here. Now, let's say your garage is 500 square feet. And the garage is where you're running your side business, right? That's where you're doing a little bit of fabrication. You might be doing some repair work, um, whatever the case may be. That's 25% of the square footage of your home. So that's 25% of your, your mortgage or your rent space. So that's going to cost your business $500 per month, right, to, to lease that space from yourself. Now, that's also a tax write-off. Uh, you can rent your space to yourself, and it's tax deductible. But check with your CPA to ensure you set that up correctly and that it's applicable in your area. That's something I'm able to do here. I can actually write off a chunk of my, uh, my garage space because that's where I do a lot of my fabrication and repairs in it. Now, you're also going to need to figure out what other utilities you're using to run your business, okay? You're going to need electricity. You're going to need water. Most likely, you're going to need internet because, you know, you have to send and receive emails. You know, you're promoting stuff on social media for your business. Like, you need internet. You can't get by with anything today nowadays with, without having internet. Uh, you probably need a phone line, you know, whether it's a landline or a cell phone or both. Uh, whatever the case may be, you're going to need to communicate. So, you're going to need a phone line. Uh, you also need a vehicle. You need to figure out your hourly wage. Now, this can be tricky, but don't get greedy, right? Don't be like, well, I want to make $100 an hour. Like, know your worth and don't sell yourself short, but like, don't overcharge for your skill set. Let's be realistic with this stuff. You're in business. You're probably not going to, ideally, you're probably not going to draw a profit out of your business for at least the first two years, but you still need to pay yourself a living wage. Like, you can't, nobody expects you to work for free for two years but you can't start pocketing those profits. So come up with a, you know, a decent hourly wage. What are, what are other folks paying people um, in, in the area that you're working at? You know, is it $20 an hour? Is it 15? Is it 25? You know, figure out what a good hourly rate for you would be for doing this type of work. You also have to figure out your insurance for liability, as well as your auto policy and any other coverages that are going to apply when it comes to insurance. Now, insurance, a lot of times, especially for business like an LLC, you know, like if you got limited or uh, you got liability coverage or general liability insurance, that's going to be an annual cost or a semi annual cost. That's one of those costs I was referring to. You just need to figure out what that annual or semi annual cost is and break that down and separate that over the course of 12 months. Okay. It's going to make sense here in a minute. Uh, you also want to figure out uh, business and professional licenses. A lot of times, those are an annual fee as well. You know, like for my CWI, I pay on that once every three years, so I need to divide that up into 36 months. Uh, certifications, do you need to have welding certifications? Okay, if so, you need to figure out what the, what the cost of those are and divide that up amongst uh, a monthly, you know, in, uh, occurring fee. Uh, now, obviously, if you get your welder cert or whatever, if, especially if you go through AWS, it's like a $60 fee twice a year because you have to renew it every six months. So take your 120 bucks. Divide that up amongst 12 months, it's going to cost you $10 a month to maintain that cert. Also, are there any annual training costs associated with the business that you're doing? Do you have to go back for continued training? Uh, business taxes, annual fees, like find out all that information and kind of build yourself out like a monthly budget. Now, these are just some of the items I was talking to when I was saying, you know, figure out your monthly expenses to determine the cost of business. And this is going to be on a case-by-case -case basis since everyone's cost and line items are going to slightly differ. These costs don't include things like consumables, materials, or anything like that to perform work. We're going to get into that in just a minute. But figure out what monthly costs you have to operate your business. Like I said, your, your rental space, all your utilities, hourly wages, vehicles, promotional materials, whether you're doing marketing, anything like that. Figure out what that's going to cost overall. Now, if you have a helper, um, you know, you're going to have to figure out what their costs are going to be as well. You also need to uh, account for any other services that you need to, to get taken care of. Like, do you have an attorney, right? You need to, you need to calculate those costs in there. Do you have a, uh, an accountant? You need to figure out what those costs are going to be. Are you paying them on a quarterly basis, annual basis, whatever? Figure out what that is and, and put that all in there. Um, along with having an employee or a helper or something to that effect, you're going to need to account not only for their hourly wages, but their workers' comp, federal income taxes, state income taxes, Medicare, Social Security, all those fun little add-ons that come with having an employee, right? Figure out what those expenses are. Once you've tabulated, and I mean, like, seriously, do some soul searching on this. 
figure out exactly what it's going to cost to run your business. Like I said, this is an area that you have a little bit of flexibility and not much, but you have some flexibility in there. Maybe you can get by with some services that um, you don't necessarily need that are just nice to have. Uh, maybe you want to eliminate those for now. You can you know, have a little bit more competitive hourly wage. But let's say you add everything up, like you got your total list of monthly expenses. Okay, and that's 13600 bucks. Okay, that's your monthly expenses. That's the cost of doing business per month. Now, you're going to divide that by 160 since there's roughly 160 working hours per month. So you got four weeks in a month, 40 hours per week. That's going to be 160 hours. So that six, or that's uh, $13,600 that it costs you to run your business, you're going to divide that by 160 hours. Okay, that gives you $85 an hour. That's your minimum charge out rate. Okay, that's the cost of doing business. That's how much you need at the end of the month to break even. Now, let's say, you know, that in there, within that $85 per hour, uh, $20 an hour, that's going to you for your paycheck uh, because obviously you need to make a living. Now, obviously, that, that $85 an hour, that may be a little high for some of you out there, and it may be way low for others. Like I said, your numbers are going to differ greatly, but that's, that's how you figure out, you know, your hourly charge out rate. What's the cost of doing business? How many hours am I going to be working? And don't base it off of, well, I plan to do 60, 70 hours a week. Like, don't, don't base it off of that. Okay. Any, any additional overtime, weekend work, or anything like that, you know, that, that's, that's a different fee that you're going to charge. I, I typically charge, you know, normal business hour fees. And then anything like weekends, nights, anything like that, that could be charged at an overtime rate. So you, you kind of have to, have to figure that out. But that $85 an hour, let's say that that's your, your working hourly rate to break even at the end of the month. That means you can stay in business. You've paid yourself. You've paid all your utilities. Your insurance is up to date. Everything, bare minimum, boom, 85 bucks an hour. Now, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that this is one of the numbers that you can somewhat change, okay? Maybe you can get your utilities or your insurance at a cheaper rate because it does pay to shop around, especially with insurances, you know, maybe every six months or maybe once a quarter, just kind of shop around. Maybe you can get some different rates. You can incur some savings that way. Or maybe you're a little too greedy with your hourly rate and maybe you pay yourself a little bit less. And maybe you don't need that $90,000 work truck and you can get away with a good old used truck for a while. Maybe you want to spend a little bit more or a little bit less on advertising. These are areas you can always play with to get the cost of doing business a little bit more reasonable. And if you have a good idea of what other shops or contractors in your area are charging, try to stay relatively close to their, to their rates. You don't want to price yourself out of work and you also don't want to cut everybody else's throat by doing work for dirt cheap. I've got uh, several buddies that kind of run their own mobile rigs down here, and I know a bunch of them, they charge anywhere from $100 to $125 an hour, and I've got another buddy that charges $85 an hour, and I keep telling them, I'm like, dude, you're selling yourself short. Everybody else is paying $100, $125, or charging $100, $125 an hour, and they're getting more work than they could shake a stick at, and he's like, he's super humble. He's like, yeah, I know. I'm just not ready to charge that kind you know, kind of money for, for my clients and my services and stuff like that. And I'm like, dude, you could do it. You can completely get away with it. So if you have an idea of what other people are charging in the area, try to stay right around, you know, what they're charging as long as you can still continue to do the business. Like if it's, uh, you know, if you need 160 bucks an hour to, to survive, maybe charge that out. You know, if, if you can, especially if you can get that type of work, whereas everybody else in the neighborhood that might be charging 125 an hour, it really depends, you know, so see if you can talk to some of the other contractors in the area, figure out what they're, you know, and a lot of people aren't really forthcoming with that information, but if you're in this line of work, you know other people that are doing this type of work, and you might be able to um, exchange information, share clients, you know, all that good stuff. So just kind of figure out where everybody else is operating if you're able, and then, you know, stay in that, that area. Now let's get down to actually bidding the work. This is the hard part because you need to price yourself just right to get the job and profit and not lose your ass in the process. So let's start off with a small project. Okay, a customer gets in touch with you and they want a fence put up outside their business with a bi-directional personnel gate and a locking hasp. And they want the gate built out of aluminum and they want it powder coated black. And they give you a set of prints to review and bid on and the posts are 10 foot apart, center to center, and the base of the posts are gonna be set into the concrete eight inches deep which is going to require you to core drill each post. 
All the aluminum needs to be welded together, so no mechanical fasteners. Uh, the hinges and locking mechanisms, they're going to be uh, installed with locking fasteners. And as of right now, that is all the information you have to submit a competitive bid to your client. So when I bid my jobs, I like to bid based off of time and material. I found out that this is the most effective way to bid most of the jobs that I do. I also like to go out and look at the area where the work needs to be performed and figure out a few things while I'm there. What does the layout of the site look like? Can I get my work truck in and around the area? Are there a lot of obstacles that prevent me from having access to where I need to perform the work? Are there a bunch of employee cars out there? You know, do I have access to the parking lot? Are there sidewalks and curbs and anything else that's going to prevent me to get to do that work? Is there anything in the way? Uh, do I need to carry the panels down a long alleyway to get to it? I do a site survey because it may not be feasible for me to get my material or my truck to the site. And I might need an extra set of hands or I might need to rent equipment to get where I need to go and get all my equipment and my tools where I need to perform the work. So do a site survey before you get out there so you don't have any surprises. Also, what does the terrain look like? Everything on the print looks like it's all flat, square, and level, but you get out there and you find out that there's like a 20-degree pitch throughout this whole thing. Now, if you built, you know, according to print, sight on scene, you built everything 90 degrees and square right there in the shop, it's, it's going to look really silly when you go to install that and it's 20 degrees out of plumb because, you know, you're, you're setting against a 20-degree offset on the landscape. The owner's not going to be happy with it, and now you're stuck with a bunch of panels that are square that aren't going to fit into, you know, an area with a slight pitch. So take that into consideration as well. You also want to consider the site in the working area. Is there a lot of foot traffic in that area that needs to be taken into account? Working in a heavily populated area with power tools and moving pieces, it's not a good idea. You're just begging for an accident. It might just be better to install on the weekends or in the evenings when nobody else is around. Okay, now this you might have to charge some after hours rates for that. Now that's why I said you should have like regular daily hours, you know, normal business hours. And then, you know, anything after maybe 5 p.m. or anything, you know, Saturday and Sunday work, you know, you figure out what those rates are going to be because that's that's time away from, you know, your family and everything else that you have going on. So that's that's an additional fee. Now, another thing I want to look for is do I have access to utilities, right? I got to go out there and core drill a bunch of these holes. Is there water and electricity there for me to use? If not, I need to factor in the cost of running a generator and running water from a tank to the drill. Okay, these can be additional costs you need to factor into the work. Uh, is there permitting required? If so, who's responsible for the permit? Okay, uh, you're also going to want to ask the customer or the contractor that's hiring you to have all the utilities located. The last thing you want to do is core drill through a bunch of fiber optics or underground utilities. Okay, that's a big expense. <laughs> it's going to cost a lot more than a hundred foot of fence and a, a, a gate, you know. So take that into consideration as well. I also like to do a site survey because I want to verify the dimensions prior to bidding the work. Maybe I need additional material because it's a little bit longer than the 100 foot that's on the blueprints. Okay, you want to make sure you're covering all your bases and estimating correctly. So go out there, do a site survey, make sure, you know, everything is going according to print. Take your dimensions, track down your utilities, figure out the access to the work, you know, and figure out any additional tooling that you're going to need. All right, we're going to go ahead and take a quick commercial break. This segment of the Art Junkies podcast is brought to you by Isotunes, where hearing meets protection. Isotunes Pro Aware earplugs bring something no other Isotunes model has, in-ear wireless hearing protection with situational awareness. With level-dependent aware technology, workers can hear colleagues and other environmental sounds without the fear of hearing damage. Pro Aware protects workers from loud impulse noises while still providing the features Isotune customers know and love. I love my Isotunes and use them while I'm at work and for the home projects after hours and on the weekends. And right now, you can save 10% at checkout when you use Art Junkies 10 in the discount box at checkout when you shop isotunes.com. We're also brought to you by Everlast Welders. The holidays may be over, but the holiday bundle packs from Everlast aren't. You can score an awesome bundle pack on some of Everlast's most popular machines to include the Lightning, Typhoon, Hurricane, Cyclone, and Power Plasma units. Now's the time to save with Everlast on awesome bundle packs for the home shop and small business. Just head over to everlastwelders.com and pick your new machine today. And as always, if you buy any machine that comes with a stock foot pedal, just type in Arc Junkies in the comment section at checkout and get that free Nova foot pedal and take torch upgrade. Everlast Welders, weld mean, weld green. Now let's get back to the show. 
All right, so once the on-site survey is done and I have all the actual measurements, now I need to bid the work. And I like to start line by line with my materials. So I calculate not only the linear feet of materials, but I also like to calculate, you know, for this case, how many pickets can I get out of a 20-foot stick? How many posts can I get out of a 20-foot stick? How many top and bottom rails can I get out? Now, there's a couple different websites that can help you out with this. One of them is Cutlist Optimizer, and the other one is Cutlist. Um, I'll go ahead and link to those in the show notes, but you want to be able to maximize your material. You don't want to buy a bunch of material and try to make the least amount of cuts and get the most amount of material. You actually want to figure out how can I get the most amount of material for you know the, the order that I'm placing because you don't want to buy any more material than you actually need to get the job done because if you start you know buying extra material just to make it easier so you can you know uh, slap six or seven pieces in the saw and then chop it at one time, and let's say you're only getting two pieces out of a stick when you actually could get three if you, uh, if you kind of worked out your math correctly, you don't want to pass those additional costs off to your client because you could actually you know lose the entire bid because you can't calculate how much material you actually need to do the job. So figure out how to optimize your cut list so you can get the most amount of material out of the material that you're ordering. Guarantee that you're going to be the one to get that bid. Now, once I get the overall material that I need, I like to get three quotes from different suppliers. I also like to ask about lead time. So depending on how soon this, you know, this, these pieces need to be installed, I may have to go with a higher cost that's going to meet my client's timeline. Now, when it comes to materials, I always add 10% uh, to compensate for offcuts or screw-ups or damaged material or things like that. I don't want to be out there, you know, trying to perform the work and be like, crap, you know, I wish I would have ordered another 20-foot stick. But 10% in building materials, usually it's a good estimate for any job, whether it's welding or laying carpet or, you know, uh, framing or anything like that. I always do about 10% more. And that's something that's kind of just served me well throughout my entire career. I don't know what it is, but that like that, that 10%, it just, it works. Okay. So figure out how much uh, linear feed of your material you're going to need and then add 10% to that. Now, once I figure out the cost of materials, I add 20% to cover all my consumables, consumables like your filler metal, okay, contact tips, shielding gas, cutoff wheels, drill bits, uh, blades, those sort of things, you know, like any, anything like that, 20% of your material cost, that's pretty much going to go to consumables. So that's why I said that's not like a monthly occurring cost. That's, that's going to go, you kind of build that into each budget, each job that you do. And if you don't use up all that material, that just becomes additional stock that you have at the, uh, at the shop. Uh, so on further bids, you know, even though you have all the consumables you need, you still add, you still add in that 20%. Eventually that, you know, starts rolling over into a profit. Now, once I have all that stuff, then I like to add in any specialty hardware. So remember the, the, the customer wants a bi swinging gate or bi-directional gate. So those are very specific hinges, then the locking hasp, end caps for all the, uh, the ends of the material, post caps, anything like that, anything that I'm not going to fabricate that has to be included in there, I'm gonna add all those costs in. And sometimes right there on the print, they'll tell you, um, you know, they'll give you a part number like McMaster car, dot, 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 or, you know, whatever. You know, they've got very specific um, locking mechanisms or hinge pieces that you need to put on there. So I always like to add that in there as a line item as well. Now you also need to calculate fuel for your rig and your welding machine for when you're driving to and from the job site as well as while you're on the job site welding, your machine's going to take gas, especially if you can't tap into the house power that they got there. You're going to have to run off an engine-driven welder or you're going to need to run off a generator or something to that effect. So, you know, calculate some fuel in there. Maybe, um, you know, figure out what it costs to run your machine for an entire eight-hour day and then kind of build that in there for each day that you're going to be out there working. Now, I also know that I'm going to need to rent some equipment. You know, like if I don't own a core drill and a bunch of bits, Um, I'm going to have to go down to one of the rental companies and I'm going to have to rent that out. So that's also another line item that I need to anticipate. I'm not that, I'm not going to include that into the, you know, the cost of doing business with the customer because I'm a nice guy. That's a separate line item because that's an additional cost that I'm going to incur. Uh, we also need to get some quotes on getting the rails and stuff powder coated. And again, you're going to want to check on lead times on these as well. So how soon can I get these rails to the powder coaters? And once they have them, how long is it going to take to get them done? I know a lot of companies that do powder coating and, you know, some of them have a couple week lead time. So make sure that that's cool with your client. So try to figure that stuff out as well. Anytime you're getting bids done, like how much is this going to cost? Your next question should be, how soon can you get me in? And when can I get the materials back? 
Okay, make that sure, make sure that that matches up with your client's uh, timeline as well. Now we need to figure out our hourly costs. From the example earlier, I know that my charge out rate for me is $85 an hour. Now let's say I have a helper with me as well. I'm gonna charge $85 an hour for that person as well. So for each of us, every hour for fabrication, install, transportation, all that stuff, I'm looking at $170 per hour. Now here comes the fun part. I need to estimate how many hours this is gonna take me to build the panels. I have to calculate cutting up the material, fitting everything up, welding everything out, detailing them, and then getting them to and from the powder coaters. I also need to estimate how long install is gonna take. And don't forget to add in the hours for doing your site survey and the hours that it's costing you to estimate this job altogether. We're not working for free here, but be mindful, you don't wanna nickel and dime your client to death either. You may not be the only bidder. So let's do a quick review of everything we need to estimate. So we've got cost of materials plus 20% for all of our consumables. We have the cost of the hardware. We've got the cost of powder coating, any rental equipment, fuel, lubricants, oils, anything like that for the maintenance of our machine and our vehicle. Uh, hourly rate for fabrication, transport to and from the powder coaters, transport to the job site, hours for estimating, site survey, and install. Once I've got my final cost and I add in any associated taxes, I like to cap everything off with my profit margin. Now in the past and up until like most recently, I've always used 10% and I've done fairly well with that. But depending on where you are and what your competition is charging, you may need to reevaluate. There's actually a book called the RS Means, which is also a software now that can help you determine kind of what your charge out rate needs to be as far as um, making profit and what other people in your industry, in your area are charging. So if you're, if you're just starting out, it's a not a necessary purchase right now, but you know, once you start getting a little bit bigger in, as a business, you know, it's, it may be something you want to consider. I know some of the software packages for that are anywhere from a thousand bucks to 1500 bucks. So just, I mean, check it out. You know, if that's something you need, um, you know, obviously go ahead and purchase it. But I mean, if you're just starting out, you're a small business, you know, you're just getting things going, you know, just try to be a competitive bidder before investing in any software like that. Now, obviously each job is going to pose its own unique problems that you, you can't always anticipate. It's not a bad idea to pad in a couple hours here and there just to be on the safe side. But like I said, don't overdo it. You don't want to nickel and dime your client. Don't be like, well, you know, I'm going to anticipate an extra, you know, 20 hours of fabrication, you know, just, just figure it out. You know, things come up, problems happen. Uh, and you kind of want to have a, a little bit of a buffer in there. So you're, you're not completely screwed. This is an example that can be used for most fabrication and install type situations. You know, it may not be a hundred foot of rail, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you need to fabricate a trailer, maybe, um, you know, somebody brings something over for repair, you know, I mean, every job's going to be a little bit different, you know, I mean, there's just so many different things you can do with welding, you can't really prepare for everything. But you can use the same rough format for repair work, you just need to add in the cost of removing and replacing parts and components. So I like doing repair work because overhead is a lot less, and it's mostly consumables and time. Once I got into teaching full time, the repair side is just where I've done most of my side jobs doing gates, handrails, restaurant equipment repairs, you know, things like that. Fabrication and installs, they just take too much time that I honestly don't have. So I like to stay in the realm of repair. But again, you can use the same formula for that. Figure out any materials you're going to need, you know, add 20% for your consumables, figure out how many hours it's going to take, you know, any, any work that I have to outsource, any equipment that I have to rent, you know, you can figure all, all that stuff. What is it going to cost to do this job, right? We're not working for free. One thing I would actually recommend everybody doing is build an Excel spreadsheet. Or if you got a Mac, obviously you can use the, the number software. Either way, it doesn't matter. It's a spreadsheet. These are awesome tools to have, and they're going to help you optimize and build a custom estimating program that's going to fit your needs. Every, like I said, everybody does a little bit different work. So once you build out one of these spreadsheets, it makes things a lot easier because you can just, you've already got everything listed out there. Uh, materials, consumables, equipment rental, like fuel, service charges, like all this stuff. You can have that listed hourly rates. You can have all these formulas plugged right in there. So all you have to do is plug in the new rates or the, uh, the new um, length and type of material for each job and everything just auto populates and it keeps your math like nice and squared away and organized so you can see everything that you're putting in when you're putting your bid together. And if you miss a line item, you can say, oh yeah, I need to, 
oh, I didn't compensate for, you know, external services like uh, powder coating or sandblasting or something like that. So, you, you know, you, you can see everything right there on the spreadsheet. And if you don't need to plug anything in, just leave it as a zero and then it'll tally everything up for you. One other thing I always recommend to people is whenever you're giving your cost to your client, don't break it down line by line. This is going to give them an opportunity to pick apart your bid and they're going to try to negotiate each line with you and all the costs associated with the work. I make sure I send my client a scope of work for the anticipated total price. That way they can't come back and say, hey, you need to do this and you know this is part of the job. If it's not what we agreed upon in the scope of work for the dollar amount that we agreed upon, then that's considered a change order and that's going to be extra. I think I've told this story on the podcast several times. I went out there to do a bunch of repairs and the, the manager came out, which I negotiated the scope of work and I negotiated the price. And she's like, hey, who's going to paint this? And I said, well, I, ma'am, I, I already painted it. You know, I performed the work and I painted it, you know, just like it said in my scope of work. She's like, well, you painted it red and the, the stairs are blue. So well, yeah, in, inside of my scope of work, it says I will coat it with one coat of red oxide paint, you know, so that it doesn't rust until you can actually hire a painter and get out here and do a color match. But I perform my scope of work. Right. She wanted me to go out there and paint it. And I said, I can do that for an extra fee. But I, I promise you, you're not going to like my painting fees if you don't like my welding fees, because I hate painting. But just make sure that your scope of work lists every single thing that you're responsible for. Make sure your client signs off on that. Make sure they agree upon the price. That way, there's no surprise when you think you're done with the scope of work and you're looking for your paycheck. You know, they're not holding anything back because, oh, well, I thought you were going to do this and that. No, it was listed right there in the scope of work. Everything's clean cut. I try to keep it as simple as possible. So just give them that scope of work. Give them the price you're going to do the work for. And, you know, that way everything's nice, clean, transparent, super simple. Uh, I, I always try to keep everything super simple so that there's no surprises at the end. Now, I also like to request from the client either 50% down or the cost of material before I start any work. I had a client one time that they wanted me to build some custom grills for them. And I told them the price and they were good with it. And they said, go ahead and start production. And I said, well, before I get started on this, I need to at least get the cost of materials up front before I do any work because it's all stainless steel. So it's, it's super expensive, right? I was looking at about $3,500 in, in material. He's like, oh yeah, no problem. I'll get back to you in a couple of days. Just go ahead, you know, start the work. And I said, once again, I, I need to get that money for the material before I can do any work. And he's like, okay, give me, give me a couple of days and you know, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get you a check prepared. About a week later, he called up and he canceled the entire job. Had I went and ordered that material and started production, I'd be stuck with a pile of stainless steel and a week's worth of work with no payment. So be vigilant and make sure that your client at least has some skin in the game with a 50% down payment or the cost of materials so you're not left holding the bag. I hope all this information helps you out along your welding journey and that you feel a little bit more comfortable bidding on your next job. If you have any more questions, you need a little bit more clarification on anything, feel free to hit me up on Instagram at Junkies Podcast, or you can drop me an email, show at arcjunkies.com. I hope you all have a great rest of your week. Stay safe out there, and until next time, make every weld better than your last.